Madame O'Leary. Thank you so much for the opportunity to speak with you today. Um, you're going to hear a bit of overlap between what Michelle had to say and what I had to say, given that we're pulling our recommendations from a joint letter that we co-sponsored. <laughs> so it will, it will sound pretty familiar. Um, and actually, Avi, uh, the color of poverty, also signed on to the open letter. So there's some overlap there as well. So my name is Darlene O'Leary. I'm the socioeconomic pol policy analyst with Citizens for Public Justice. Citizens for Public Justice, or CPJ, is a national faith-based charitable organization that works on Canadian public policy, primarily in the areas of poverty eradication in Canada, ecological justice, and refugee rights. We co-lead Dignity for All, a national campaign for a poverty-free Canada, with our partners Canada Without Poverty. And for the past decade, CPJ and Dignity for All have called for the creation of a comprehensive and legislated national anti-poverty plan for Canada. Our campaign has been endorsed by close to 800 organizations and over 12,000 individuals across the country. So today I'll speak specifically to Division 20 and recommendations we've made on the Poverty Reduction Act. In an open letter sent to the Honourable Minister Jean-Yves Duclos in February, sponsored by CPJ, Canada, Canada Without Poverty, and Campaign 2000, and signed by over 500 organizations and individuals, we outlined our position on the Poverty Reduction Act, making specific recommendations to strengthen the legislation. As you know, and Michelle mentioned, this act, which was previously Bill C-87, was tabled in Parliament and went to second reading before being added, without amendments to the Budget Act. Our recommendations include the following. The Poverty Reduction Act should reflect Canada's international human rights commitments, including the commitment that Canada has made in adopting the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. The targets and timelines identified currently in the legislation reflect the minimum goals set out in the SDGs to reduce poverty rates, as we've heard, by 20% by 2020 and 50% by 2030 using the 2015 market basket measure rates as a starting point for these targets. However, as M Michelle mentioned, the first SDG goal to which Canada has committed is no poverty. We recommend that the legislation be amended to reflect this as the ultimate goal with a much more ambitious timeline. Otherwise, we are failing to honour our international commitments and are implicitly claiming that it is acceptable to leave behind those remaining in poverty once the minimum goals are met. We also recommend that the legislation be amended to affirm economic and social rights as ratified by Canada in international human rights laws. In addition, the legislation recognizes the new official poverty line, as has been discussed already, as a market basket measure, or MBM, while the legislation indicates that the MBM be subject to regular review, it should ensure that review takes place no longer than every three years. It should include public input to ensure that the costing of items identified as part of a basket of necessities reflects the actual costs experienced by low-income households, and that the basket includes an adequate and appropriate range of costs. The current MBM based has not been updated since 2011 with a slight adjustment in 2012, though as we've heard earlier it is presently under review. That means that the costs being calculated now, for example the cost of shelter, are vastly underestimated for some communities. Given that the MBM could now be used to establish eligibility and access to needed programs and benefits for low income people, regular and public reviews are essential. The legislation should also recognize that no one measure of low income or cost captures the reality of poverty. So a range of publicly available data sets should be included in assessing progress and achieving targets. Further, the new National Advisory Council on Poverty is being established to advise and report to the minister and engage with the public in reviewing the progress of the federal poverty reduction strategy. For this council to be effective, it must be independent, adequately resourced, and given authority to make recommendations and require remedial action for compliance with economic and social rights. There must be a transparent process for appointment of council members, including the establishment of criteria of qualifications and inclusion of people with lived experience of poverty. 
We recommend that section 11, which authorizes the dissolution of the council, as has been discussed already as well, uh, to be uh, the dis dissolution of the council once poverty has been reduced by 50% by 2015 levels. We recommend that that uh, section be removed or amended, amended to ensure an ongoing mandate for the council to oversee the goal of sustained poverty eradication. And uh, to reiterate what Michelle said, in addition, we want to see the federal government work in, pop in partnership with indigenous governments to co-develop initiatives to ensure accountability and implementation of remedies for distinctive barriers faced by First Nations, Inuit, and Métis people living in poverty. And further elaboration of our recommendations is available in the open letter that we've submitted and also in the brief that we've jointly submitted under the Dignity for All campaign.